All right, you were grabbing a seat. This is cool. It's the day you don't want to be late because you end up way at the back there. I can see those people who are late. Yeah, come welcome. Oh, shame. Never mind. Um, there is forgiveness in Jesus. It's, it's Easter weekend. Hey, many people are thankful for many different things. Um, some people are thankful for a cold, um, a cold day where they can have a fire and warm their hands with fire. Some people are thankful for hot chocolate. Who's thankful for hot chocolate? Yes, I have friends out there. Um, some people are thankful for cold pizza and warm pizza. I mean, they like it cold or warm. Who likes pizza cold or warm? Yes, next day the pizza. Some people are thankful because they get their dream car like a Tesla. Um, and there are different reasons to be thankful. Maybe for you it's a, a new phone, a new pair of shoes, a new relationship. One of the things I'm thankful for is air conditioning. I had a car over the, over the summer that didn't have air conditioning. And I suffered. And in February, finally I got it fixed. And so I'm really thankful for this last little while that I've had air conditioning in my, in my car. And it's been really cool. Being thankful is a, a practice the world talks about today that's really important. It's in the business world, being thankful to the customer for buying something at the end of a sales pitch. Thank you. It's in the high-performance high sports world. We'd say, thank you for those hard hills. It's in the, it's in the well-being space about being thankful. Um, and there are many different things you can be thankful for, but they have a result in our lives. And I looked up and I found some expert says it reduces depression, uh, reduces stress. The one I like the most is number six. It helps improve stress. So if you're thankful, you get a better night's sleep. So lately I've been saying to my wife, thank you, and then go to sleep. But if we're honest, we know that actually uh, you have to have a real reason to be thankful for. Otherwise, you don't get the benefits in your life. Now, as Christians today in this world, and we have ups and downs, we also know that we can be very thankful because we have some spiritual reasons to be thankful, particularly over Easter. Now, the Apostle Paul, one of the New Testament writers, gives us a huge amount of information for us to be thankful for, covers a whole bunch of spiritual reasons. And I'd like to look at some of those reasons, or just one of those reasons this morning, from Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to look at chapter 1, verse 7. So you have your Bibles, flick there. And I'm just going to take the one verse. Now, I've chucked on the, the screen for you verses 3 to verses 14. Because this is actually one big sentence in Greek. And, and Paul just goes on and on about how cool God is. In fact, this is probably the longest Greek sentence you'll ever read in your life. Now, you might think your friends speak long and long and long. But Paul, with 202 words in Greek, this is just a mammoth sentence. Huge sentence. Now, for the sake of today and our, our theme, I'm just going to look at verse 7. I'm going to look at a few things from verse 7. But there is heaps of things going on this long, complicated sentence. Now, a lot of the times, praise or um, thanksgiving is quite long. But this is mammothly long. Now, how many aspects of thankfulness does, does Paul jam in this one sentence? Well, different scholars, different Bible uh, people think of different things. Some people they think there's about seven. Some say there's about 11 aspects of thankfulness in here. And it depends on really how you break it down to categories, whether you break it down to themes or sub-themes. But they all agree that Paul is being thankful to God. Verse 1 talks about being blessed, blessed be God, used eight times. This idea of speaking well of God, sort of like an eulogy. And so Paul spends 202 words talking about how cool God is. Now the purpose here is this, so that we can appreciate our spiritual salvation. He's going to tell us why it is so, so cool for us to have this amazing salvation that we have in God. So we're going to look at just um, one idea from this, this passage. Let's just read this passage together about thankfulness. And it's from Ephesians 1.7. In him we have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Now, the first thing that Paul does here, he introduces to us a new word, which is redemption. Now, the word redemption is used about eight different times. Well, ten times in the, in the, in the text. Now, these ten times, um, you'll notice, uh, eight, seven of them are actually translated with the word redemption. There's three that are not, because they don't quite match the context. What's happening here is this, this new idea. Now, it's sort of new, but not quite new. If you know the Old Testament, you know Jesus' sayings, you kind of already picked up on it a little bit. Jesus said, I've come not to serve, but to serve others and give my life as a ransom. This idea of ransom, which is part of the redemption process. You need a ransom. But here, Paul talks about the whole process 
of redemption. And so we're going to look at this idea. Now, before we go any further, I just thought it'd be quite just quickly to look at what this word means. What does the word redemption mean? So just a little bit geeky. We're going to look at a lexicon so you can feel like you're intelligent today. And the idea from a lexicon is this. To release or set free with the implication of this kind of the process going on, freeing a slave or a person in captivity. Okay? So this idea of a process, a big process going on. Just a little bit more geekier, we'll look at a, uh, a theological dictionary. And I just bear with me because I think it's helpful just to get our understanding around the, the grouping of these words. And it says this. Whenever a person, by their own fault or through a superior power, have come under the control of someone else and have lost their freedom to implement their own will and decision, and where their own resources are inadequate to deal with the other power, they can, they can regain, regain their freedom only by the intervention of a third person. So you'll notice here there's a couple of ideas. You've come under the control of somebody else. You've lost your freedom to decide if you want to go to Starbucks or not. Um, you haven't got any resources in your pocket to buy yourself Starbucks. You've got nothing. And you can only gain your, your freedom by intervention of a third party. And so here's this basic idea that we have. A concept of external help, the redemption. So this is something that Jesus said. He said, come to me, all you, and I will give you rest. Not come to me and I'll give you cool new ideas, but come to me and I'll give you rest. This is this idea that we, we go to Jesus and he gives us this rest external to us. Now, this word metaphor is a beautiful word for the early Christians. They lived in a world where they understood this word. They understood this word from two reasons. One, their biblical framework. They grew up in the Old Testament. They understood the story of Exodus, which we're celebrating today, the escape from slavery, the Passover meal. They understood God's firstborn. They understood the rules around prisoners and captivity. And even the Ruth, the book of Ruth, the story of Ruth, the, the redemption of Ruth. So they understood that. Also, they understood it from the other framework, which is they lived in a Roman culture where there were slaves that needed to be redeemed, and there was also lots of prisoners from different countries that also needed to be redeemed. So these guys would have understood this metaphor really, really well. So when Paul used this metaphor, they would have like easily clicked, understood the points of comparison, and really related to it. And we can too today in many ways, because this word is still alive. Now, I'd like to just do a little bit of a creative idea, because I'm new to this job and I can't really get fired just yet. So... Um, I'm going to pretend the table one, you guys are table one, your country one, and your table two, and your country number two, your table three, you can be Switzerland, and you guys are the latecomers, so you can be table four. Um, and what's going to happen, just to, 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 to put this back into our perspective, is this, a sad story, but just for the illustration, we're going to use this. Uh, table one went to war against table two. Now, uh, table two won the war, so put your hands down. But the good news is the war is over. But during this war, someone was taken captive back to the country table number two. So I'm going to need a volunteer from table one to be my... Would you like to be the volunteer? Okay, come on over here. Come on over here. Come on. Now, he's been captured as a, as a slave. And you can come and sit by Reuben. He's a nice guy. Oh, he's crying. That's good. He is sad because he's never going to see his parents again. His mother is sad. He's now lost the freedom. His mother lets him go to Starbucks. He's lost all his freedom. He's sitting over there. And that's the, that's, the sad, that's the sad news. The good news is that this table over here, this country, loves him so much that they want to go through the process of redemption. They want to buy him back. And so they go over. Uh, Annika, I want you to take gold, a form of currency, go give it to Reuben, and then uh, bring, the, bring the captive person back over. So table two, um, do the trade. Yep, bring them back. Give the room the chocolate. Wonderful. And this table celebrates. Great. With a Whitaker's bar of gold chocolate, which is really cool. And so the early people in the church realized this model. They lived in a Roman world where there was war going on all the time. They knew the rules around war, the, the process. So this word is actually not a Christian word. It's a word in their culture, redemption. And so these people redeemed. Now, obviously, this table's a nice table to be with. Reuben's a nice guy. But when we're talking about real redemption, you know, you're bringing them back. And now you've got your son back. And he can make his bed. 
which is really cool. So with that framework in mind, let's just pop ourselves through this verse. So first of all, we've got this external help of redemption. The first thing you see there, Paul points out, is in him, connected with Christ. The word in indicates a relationship, a close relationship. Hence, redemption is actually with the person of Jesus. It can't be separated like an item. Now, in illustration, it's actually a separated item. It's a chocolate bar over there. But when Jesus redeems us, it's actually connected with him personally. It's intertwined with him. The second idea that Paul has here is we have, which is right now, it's present aorist tense, meaning right now we have redemption. So this young man over here has redemption. He's back with his mother. But also, you'll see this in verse 7, it is this, but 50% 50 of the time he actually uses this word as future. So you have this idea that actually it's an ongoing situation. We have redemption, historical past, yes, but also we have a future redemption. An ongoing redemption. Today we have redemption. This week we have redemption in our spiritual journey with Jesus. So it's both, which is really, really cool. The next one is this, number four. It's through his blood. This is the cost. This is the cost of redemption. The process demands a ransom. It's one of the key characteristics of this concept. And this is the concept they would have picked up the early Christians very, very well. It demands a ransom. Something needs to be paid. So what is being paid here is that Jesus has died on the cross for him. So in our, uh, in our exercise here, we paid a chocolate bar, which is really cool. Um, when my car needed fixing the air conditioning, it cost $2,000 to get fixed. I just about fell over. But apparently, talking to people, that's not, too, that's not too bad a price. But when you think about redemption, when you think about the cost of Jesus, God the Son, dying on the cross for our sins... It's a huge cost. It's more than a $4 chocolate bar. It's more than $2,000 to fix your air conditioning. It's the cost of Jesus' life. And when you think about it, you cannot measure it financially. All your accountants out there, you can't measure it financially. All you emotionally people out there, you can't measure it with emotions. Even intellectual people can't really think through the amount of cost it would cost for Jesus to die for us. And that's what we're celebrating with Easter. This weekend is when Jesus on Good Friday, which would be called Bad Friday, died for our sins. And then he's risen for us. And so he paid that cost. So Easter is all about celebrating this ransom, this bar of chocolate paid to bring us back into this relationship with God because we were broken. And now we have redemption. Now, a lot of people use the word redemption in different ways today. But originally it was used to buy someone back. Today we talk about self-redemption, like the All Blacks. This weekend, the All Blacks are going to redeem themselves. They've been training hard. They've worked out what they can do. The redemption in the Bible is talking about you can't redeem yourself. You need external help. And that's why Jesus came to earth, born, lived amongst us, perfect, and he died for us, paid the ransom. We don't imitate Jesus. We actually need his help internally. We need his help. So the next part is this. Um, forgiveness. Cancellation of sin's obligation. What does it mean to be forgiven? It means to remove the guilt resulting from the wrongdoing, to remove that guilt from our actions that we've behaved. So who needs forgiveness? Okay, no hands. That's good. Now, some of you might be able to say, I don't need a brand new car because I've got an old car and it works well. Some of you might say, I don't need a car because I've got a bike or I live near a train station. But all of us in this room actually need forgiveness. Anyone who lives in New Zealand, anyone who's lived more than 10 seconds realize that you need forgiveness. Because as humans, we're broken relationship with others. We've got a broken relationship with ourselves, and we've got a broken relationship with God. The good news is, the good news of Easter is what? We've actually got redemption through Jesus, which is so important. Now, a long time ago, me and my wife, Natasha, Natasha and I, we had a beautiful dinner. Natasha made us a beautiful dinner. It took about more than an hour. How long did it take? Probably ages. And this is before we had kids, when we had time. You know, that feeling you had time? So we, uh, we had this beautiful dinner, and my wife cooked it, spiced it all beautifully, put it on the table. And I thought to myself, what I need is ketchup. <laughs> so as a good Kiwi man, I went to the cupboard and got the ketchup out and put it on the table. And my normal method is to go <sighs> all over it so you can't see the food. And my wife gently but very firmly said to me, Hayden, don't put ketchup on this meal. Of course, I knew that I wanted ketchup as my way. I'll do what I want to do. And I poured it all over, probably even a little bit more than I normally do. 
just just say that the meal didn't taste very nice. Our relationship was broken. Um, there was a tense meal, and it was not good for me. Um, but the cool thing is, the wonderful thing is that we have a redeemer that can restore our broken relationships. We fail, we stuff up, but we've got this external help. Now, there's a process we have to go through, a process of, of seeking redemption, of accepting the external help, and apologizing. So sin cancels that obligation. It gets rid of it. There's a process that goes on. And so our guilt is canceled. Now, just an important point, extremely important point. The wrongdoing guilt is canceled, but the actual action is not gone. So the event of me doing that source has not gone. What happened that night has not gone. It's still a historical event. But the guilt, the obligation of sin to death has gone. So now we can sort of joke about it. I can talk about what I did to my wife. The person I said I love, the person I'm supposed to care for, and yet I broke her heart. I upset her um, with tomato. Now we both love tomato sauce, and my, we both love Heinz. It just wasn't the right time for that sauce on that particular night. So I'm glad that we have forgiveness. And of course, uh, next one, from our trans, uh, transgressions, our, our sin. So what is sin? Sin is not how you feel. It's not what you think is right or wrong. It's not what your culture tells you. Sin is it's, it's in relationship to God's character. When we sin, we actually step outside of the boundaries that God's put there for us. We walk in a way we shouldn't. We end up going into chaos, into brokenness. We think we're pretty cool. Now you're thinking, but what's that got to do with tomato sauce? Well, actually, there's no verse in the Bible that says don't put tomato sauce on a special meal. But there's a verse in the Bible that says show love, show kindness, show respect. And so, therefore, I broke God's character by not showing love and respect to someone who loves me. And so sin. Who who sin? All of us. And all of us need this, this beautiful forgiveness we have to be free from guilt. Right, moving on to the last one. According to the richness of his grace. So God in his character is loving and kind. So God died on a cross for us, not because he wanted something, but because he loved us. Not because we're special, but we are special, but because of his love. His love motivated what he did for us this weekend, which is amazing. It reveals God's character. He's a loving, kind God. He hates sin. He cannot have a relationship with sin, but he loves us so much that he'll deal with the sin that we have. So my question is, how are we going to respond to redemption? Well, firstly, if you do not experience the true meaning of Easter, I invite you to start this process of learning about how you can restore your relationship with God and others. That there is outside help. All the yuck that's inside us, all the brokenness, if we want to be honest, it's there. We can actually go to Jesus. So that's the first thing we can do. You know, we can recognize that air conditioning in our car is broken and go, I'm feeling really hot. This is terrible. My relationships are breaking apart. Inside me, there's yuck. That's the first thing we can do. The other thing we can do is be thankful to God. Just like my air conditioning in my car, it was broken. And when it was fixed, every time I get in my car, I'm like, thank you, it's working. When I get home, I say, it's so nice to drive home with air conditioning. And my wife goes, yeah, it's cool. And I go and tell other people, hey, your car's broken. You should get air conditioning. And they go, but it's $2,000. Well, the cool thing about Jesus is Jesus paid the price. We couldn't pay the price, but he did. So we can be thankful. To God. Every time we come to church, every time we get up in the morning or see a sunset, we go, God, thank you for paying the ransom for me. We can tell other people in our life. We can tell people who are going through the situation that we've gone through and point them to Jesus. And then also today we're going to do something a little bit special. We're going to have a fellowship time together where we say thank you to God together. The Passover, and that's what we're sitting in, is in a, in a U shape. This is how Jesus sat, but he sat on the floor. I thought I'd lose my job if I lay you on the floor. So we're sitting in seats. But Jesus sat around like this, and it was a fellowship offering. They didn't go to the temple. They stayed together, and they ate this meal. And out of that meal, that fellowship, they said, thank you for the redemption that they have for their slavery, for their spiritual slavery now for us. And so we're going to practice that as well. We're going to stay at our tables. We're going to have a light meal together and celebrate this resurrection, this redemption Sunday together. So let me close in prayer, and then Di will come up, and she will coordinate what's going to happen next. Father God, I want to thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your work of redemption in our lives, Lord. We thank you that you came to us. You seeked us, and you brought us back into fellowship with you, Lord. You restored us. Lord, we thank you for Easter. We thank you for this precious time um, 
that you, that you paid for our, our price, Lord. We can't even think how much it would have cost you emotionally or financially, intellectually, Lord. It was such a sacrifice. And we just want to say thank you, Lord. We thank you for the time we're going to have to now together to uh, enjoy fellowship with one another because of what you've done for us in our lives. And all God's people said... I didn't know.